devices, and you can have fun as well. And some of the things that we saw from our previous invent on was a uh, automatic pill dispenser, water recycler, water recycling turbine, uh, reusable heat and a uh, heat battery. Um, let's see. Uh, ultrasonic walking cane, and among other things. And here's a video of her last invent on. We'll be posting some uh, videos from last Inventathon as well as some inspirations for this year in a bit. But uh, first, who's here to help you on your invention journey? Well, we have me, Arsalan, and Ashvin over there in the corner. Uh, we're all pretty good experts in uh, some field of like making things. So you can uh, definitely ask us for help. We also have. We have our Houston officers. Everyone, please say hi. Uh, yeah, there's Sign out there. There's Ryan over there taking photos. Masayuki, who just introduced. And uh, Kenneth is back there doing registration. Um, all of these guys can help you as well. They uh, were on one of our winning teams last year, making a uh, basically like water-powered uh, car charger. So definitely rely on them for some help. We also have our Clemens inventors, uh, including Mr. Hart, um, who's in there. Most of them are actually in that room right now. Uh, and they're also really experts. Uh, Mike and uh, Yusuf are leading a CAD workshop. Uh, it's on the flyer that you guys got. So you can see the timings there. Um, so yeah. And we also have our experts from HCC. Roland Fields, who pretty much mans that additive lab, the fab lab right there. Uh, you can you know, basically use the 3D printers, laser cutters, and build any part of your invention with his help. And we have Ravi from ACC, who's uh, you know, one of our key organizers. So go to our URL, tinyurl.com slash join dash invent. So I mean, the key takeaway you guys should take from all of that is that there are a ton of resources for you to use, and they're all here to help you make the next big thing. Now, are you guys ready to invent? Yeah? I mean, that's, 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 a, that's a weak yeah. Let's hear a bigger yeah. Yeah? Yeah. 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 All right, and with that, I'd like to invite our guest speaker, Ashok Rao, here. Uh, Ashok, Mr. Rao is uh, a very successful entrepreneur. He's uh, like led an IPO, so a public offering of a company worth over hundreds of million dollars. Um, and he's a very successful investor as well. And uh, he's uh, a great speaker. I've watched a few of his YouTube videos, uh, including a TEDx talk. So I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Thank you, Nikhil. Uh, I guess uh, I'm going to have to use the microphone because uh, if I were to just stand here, can you hear me? Uh, if you do the mic, it'll, it'll be better for the live stream. It'll be better for the live stream. Yeah. You know, it's like putting me in a prison, making me stand in one spot. Do you want to take this on and walk with it? Yes, I will. I will. I will. <laughs> all in its good time. Good morning, everyone. Great, great to meet all of you. Hopefully, I'll get to meet some of you individually after this thing is over. But um, I'm very um, sort of enthused about being here today, not because, you know, every speaker says, boy, it's great to be here, and they really don't mean it. But this is it's for us, uh, several reasons. One, talking to students is always very invigorating. But secondly, I'm going to talk to you about a topic, a speech, a set of thoughts 
that has taken me two years to put together and this is the first time I'm presenting it. And I couldn't think of a better audience to present it. This is an idea that I had after reading several research publications and books by a very bright, brilliant uh, Stanford scientist, and we'll get to him in a minute. So about two years ago, I said, gee, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could put together a speech about the six technologies that have changed the world? And Nikhil talked about you guys need to change the world. You can see how the world was changed. And I challenge any of you to guess which any of the six are. Anyone want to take a guess? What are one of, even one of those six technologies that changed the world? Come on, guys. It's not that early. No. But you are circling the area. The technology is uh, it's pointless for me to keep. Uh, oh, there's one more hand. Brave hand went up. No. But uh, th that's why the title of the program is You Will Never Guess What They Are. Yes. No, not dynamite. Young lady. No. No. Yeah. No. However, so we can keep going at this, but you will, I hope, well, I enjoyed putting it together, and it's taken me several, several months of work to put this thing together. You are my guinea pigs, the first to hear it, and I hope uh, you enjoy it at least half as much as I enjoyed putting it together. So first I have to thank my guru in this whole topic, his work, is the one that inspired me. He's the one that, you know, the absolute brilliant genius at Stanford who has done all this research work and I'm essentially plagiarizing his thoughts and ideas and adding to it my own, uh, well, it's not plagiarizing if you give somebody credit for it, if you attribute it. So I am actually paying homage to him before we start. So let us look at first a concept of nature. You know, nature innovates. Nature for the last 350 million years, or since the Big Bang, 2.3 billion years ago, has been innovating its way to where we are today. And nature has a very good ability to solve its own problems. You know, the amoeba became two cells, and then we had reptiles crawl out of the water, and all of these various things. But sometimes, as they're solving the problems of natural evolution, they trigger other things. Now, here is a thought of what the other things are. Think about 100 million years ago during the Cretaceous period. You all know Cretaceous from Jurassic, right? You've all seen the movie Jurassic Park. Prior to the Jurassic Park, the Cretaceous period, flowers first started to emerge from planet Earth. Now, they're a living thing, and they need sexual reproduction strategies. How do flowers propagate? Well, they do it through pollination. But then, how does an inanimate flower standing in one place pollinate a flower 100 yards away or a mile away? So they began to develop what we call this attraction for other things that were being created by nature at the time, which is pollen is what is needed to pollinate. But how do you get insects to come and take your pollen from A to B? Well, they started to get nectar. So nectar, sweet nectar, was the hook to bring insects to the flower to drink the nectar, to fly to another flower, but in the process, the pollen that fell on their back would pollinate the other flower. You all get that? So the insects in evolved. They were non-vertebrates because you have to be a non-vertebrate to hover. You have to be able to hover to be able to go over a flower, stick your proboscis in, pull out the nectar, and then go on to the next flower. You all following me? Is this making sense to you guys? So the insects developed the ability to hover and the ability to extract nectar. And that's how they were able to satisfy the sexual reproduction strategy of flowers. But at the same time, something very strange happened. As flowers and insects were evolving, another creature, a much larger animal, evolved as well, a vertebrate. And there is only one vertebrate on Earth that can hover it. Anybody want to take a guess? You got it. Smart guy in the room. His vertebrate called a hummingbird. What they developed was a terrific way of 
flapping their wings in a, rot in a uh, rotating manner, creating downforce and upforce, and allowed them to hover. So this is what we call the hummingbird effect. The hummingbird effect is when things happen, not just with nature, but by people, where you intend one thing, and something dramatically different occurs. And it's not really the survival of the fittest, like Darwin said, because that's a zero-sum game. You know, the, the strong eat the weak, that sort of thing. This is the co-evolutionary survival of a variety of creatures in nature and in real life on planet Earth. We have several examples of the hummingbird effect, and that's what the six technologies are all about. So are we are ready to see what the six technologies are? Well, I call them the Johnson Six, and here they are. Glass, the technology of glass, the technology of cold, the technology of sound, the technology of clean, time, and light. You're all going, duh, what is that, right? Did anyone say duh that I didn't hear? You all probably did. Well, let's look at it. Let's look at glass, which is the oldest technology. The technology of glass really started 26 million years ago when Libya was covered by sand. You know, sand and silicon dioxide is the most abundant material on Earth. 90% of the Earth's crust is made up of sand, of silicon dioxide. And a comet hit the Libyan desert creating heat in excess of 1,000 degrees, because that's what it takes to melt silicon dioxide, and turned the surface of the Libyan desert into glass. Because you need that heat. You need 1,000 degrees. But silicon dioxide is the only material that can melt, and when it unmelts or solidifies, does not return to its original state. Think about water, ice. Ice melts. You freeze it turns back into ice. Think about liquid nitrogen. Think about any other substance on Earth. The surface of the Libyan desert for 26 million years was covered with glass, till about 5,000 years ago when Howard Carter explored King Tut's tomb. He found that there was glass being used for ornamental purposes. So the first use of glass was used by the Egyptians for ornamental purposes, scarabs, crowns, various things, because they were very translucent. You, they weren't clear, and they could be used for jewelry. And then it evolved to where, from purely ornamental uses, they became useful. Right around the turn of the, uh, well, right around Constantinople being formed in the year 300 AD, because the Romans moved there, and they ran into all the Turkish glass blowers and then they started to use glass for vessels to store wine and to store ointments and to store other kinds of liquids. You guys following it? Is this all sort of making sense to you? How the technology of glass has evolved. So till a very dramatic event occurred in 1204 AD. Anybody remember who that, what that is? Come on guys, you're a history major, anyone here? It's the sacking of Constantinople when Constantinople was conquered by the Fourth Crusade. You know, the Crusaders were supposed to go liberate Jerusalem. Instead, these guys said, oh, there's a lot of money, a lot of gold, a lot of jewelry in Constantinople. Why don't we make a left turn, go rob and sack them? So they went and sacked Constantinople. OK, for history people, that's a totally different set of discussions. But for our purpose, for the technology of glass, something very unique happened. All the Turkish glass blowers that lived in Constantinople said, you know, we're having problems here because we're going to get killed. Let's run to Venice. So they fled to Venice, which is where, by the way, these crusaders had come from. They, were, they had come from Venice and then attacked Constantinople. So then what happened? They became a big hit in Venice. Venice at that time was the richest country in the world, uh, richest country, city. It was a country city. And ornamental glass became a big hit and became a big export and import item. They were very wealthy glass makers. And one problem, glass needs a lot of heat, needs 1,000 degrees, very hot fire. Venice was made of wood. <laughs> what, what kind of combination is that? Oftentimes, these glass makers would burn down parts of Venice. 
Not very good for the people of Venice, even though the money they were making on all that beautiful glass was great. So what happened? The king of Venice, known as the Doge, exiled them to Murano, an island a mile away from Venice. Anyone know where Murano is? Anyone know what Murano glass is? The most expensive glass in the world. So what ended up happening is that because all of these glassmakers were put into an island which is only about a mile wide, they un, uh, unintentionally created an innovation hub, just like we're having here today. We a whole bunch of innovators sitting together, cross-pollinating thoughts, and all of a sudden, glassmaking went through the roof. There was a guy called Angelo Borivier in the year 1297, figured out to take the ashes of burnt seaweed, mixed it with melted glass, and he got clear glass. You know, we take looking at through clear glasses and, uh, for, for granted, but it didn't exist till 1297. And because it resembled quartz, which is almost clear, he called it by the Italian name for quartz, cristallo. And that's why we have the word crystal for clear glass. Interesting? Any of this making sense to you guys? Well, we got a lot more to come. So glass was always then used for the next 100, 200 years. People figured out that if you had a convex surface for the glass, it acted like a lens. It magnified what you had, were reading. And so monks, priests, were the only people who could read back in those days. And what did they read? They basically read the Bible and made laborious hand copies of it until something else happened, until one of the guys mentioned the Gutenberg Press. And to read it, because they typically had to work well into the night and they only had candles made of animal fat, they needed of the word lenses. Why do we call them lenses, right? Anyone thought about that? Because they resembled lentils. And in Italian, it's called lentes. So now, for monks, people who could read and write, because most of the population of the world at that time was illiterate. People didn't know how to read, didn't know how to write, and they were basically farsighted, like I am today, now that I'm 68 years old. At the age of 50, I needed reading glasses. And most people didn't realize that they were farsighted and they would need something to be able to read because they were illiterate. And then came what I think is the most extraordinary hummingbird effect in the history of our planet. Things changed after what is arguably the greatest innovation of the millennium that we just went past. And that is the Gutenberg Press. In 1442, Gutenberg came up with a print printing press where he was essentially reprinting Bibles. And we all know, and a lot of experts talk about the effect the Gutenberg Press had on the world, on religion. You know, people were able to read and people were able to get books cheaply the father of the modern internet, he's called even. But let's think about a hummingbird effect that the Gutenberg Press had. With books now being available, people wanted to read. And suddenly they realized that they couldn't because they were farsighted. They needed lenses to read. And then we had this concept of, so, so before we get to the, the microscope, they ended up, spectacle makers became the richest people in Europe. It became the number one product. Like today, what's the smartphone is probably the number one product. Lenses, spectacles were the number one product. And then in 1590, a guy called Zacharias Janssen in Delft, Netherlands, figured, okay, instead of having these two spectacles side by side, why don't we put the one behind the other? And you got a microscope. And from a microscope, Galileo, one of the greatest inventors of all time, came up with a telescope. Looked into the sky. What did he see? Anyone know what Galileo is most famous for? Bingo. Oh, went to the head of the class, that young man. He saw that Jupiter had moons that revolved around Jupiter. And he said, wait a minute. That means the sun doesn't revolve around us. We revolve around the sun. And that's when the world changed. The world from Aristotle to Copernicus 
names I'm throwing out, but names worth going back. Now that we have Google, you can just Google, who's Aristotle? Who's Copernicus? That world completely changed to a world where now we knew that the Earth and the planets revolve around the sun. And Galileo did so many more, other more things, and some more will come up. This changed the world, because what happened with the telescope? Well, glass ended up giving us spectacles, ended up giving us microscope, which allowed us to see things that we had never seen before, germs. Van Hookbeck was the first guy to be able to look through a microscope and see germs. At that time, they didn't know what germ theory was, but they said, oh, this is, these are some creatures that are not visible to the naked eye or to glasses. We are able to see through telescopes, able to get natural progression of glass with cameras, with lenses, movies, Hollywood, coated glass, and you got television, all of which is all a product of glass that you take for granted. You watch TV and you fix fibers. And do you know how fiberglass was invented? Today we take it for granted. Well, there was a guy called Boys, Charles Boys, and he wanted to be able to weigh something, and he thought a very thin shard of glass would be a very good way to create a balance beam to weigh some very small amounts. And he experimented with a crossbow. And he took a molten piece of glass and attached it to the tail end of the crossbow and shot the crossbow 90 feet. And as the bolt went out, it pulled this little shard of glass with it. And he got a 90 foot long fiber. That was the birth of fiber optics. Today, we have it everywhere. One of the 70 by Bell Labs and Corning. And today, they're the backbone of everything. You know, we have communications between continents because it's the idea of glass with lasers shooting lights through the glass and lasers are also created by glass. Computers at both ends based on microchips that are from glass and ships that lay and repair the cables and this could not be possible without that piece of fiber that connects the two continents. You all love to take selfies, right? Who doesn't like to take a selfie here? You don't like to take a selfie. Okay. Well, Miss USA here doesn't like to take a selfie. Now, she is Miss USA, by the way. Lauren, meet the rest of the kids. See, they're more interested in you than they're in me. But think about taking of a selfie. You take your selfie, you upload it to Facebook, it circulates across the globe on glass fibers, and then people see it on screens made of glass. Isn't glass dominating your life when it comes to a selfie? And it's all because of glass. Glass lenses uh, all the way down to when you, where you look at them on glass screens. Silicon dioxide all the way. But we're not done with glass yet, because glass has had another major way of changing the world, something that I don't think is very intuitive. See, back to Murano in, 18, in 1400. They was, till then, the only way people could look at themselves, reflections, was either in a pool of water or on polished metal. Don't forget, clear glass didn't exist till 1297. And then, in the middle of the 14th century, some glassmakers decided to coat the back of a clear piece of cristallo with tin and mercury. And what did we get? We got the mirror. So think about it. The mirror didn't exist till 600 years ago. People could never really see who they were till the mirror showed up. And think about that. Till then, people were in collectives. You were the family. You were the village. You were the tribe. You were the fiefdom. You were the kingdom. All of a sudden, people were beginning to look at themselves. And suddenly, the influence of the individual, people said, ah, oh, that's me. I'm important. The start of democracy, where a person mattered, comes right back to glass. Hummingbird effect. Young man over there, is that, was that interesting for you? Not really, right? 
And finally, on glass, and we'll get on to other things, mirrors let us look beyond ourselves because all telescopes today are made of mirrors. The McDonald's, the Keck, they're all giant mirror combinations. Do you all know how telescopes work? There are a whole bunch of hexagonal mirrors, double reflectors, to capture light from millions and millions of light years away. So what does, what does glass allow us to do? Not only lets us look at ourselves, but it lets us look at our past. Because when you're looking hundreds and millions of light years away, what are you looking at? You're looking at the past. And all of this is the knowledge of the universe is enabled by glass. Just, so just think of a thousand degrees of heat and furnace for all this to happen. Pretty much the ultimate hummingbird effect, isn't it? And that's the story of the technology of glass. So let's go to the second one, cold. When you think about the technology of cold, am I putting you guys to sleep? Is this of any interest to you guys? Are you following this? Because I had a ball coming up with these ideas, but I don't know about you guys. Cold, let me brush through it. Cold, the technology of cold is only 200 years old. People suffered in great heat in most parts of the world because that's where most of the population was. You didn't have too many Eskimos, but you had a lot of people in Africa and Asia, Central America, places that were warm. And so in the early 1800s, a gentleman by the name of Frederick Tudor in Boston decided to ship blocks of ice from the frozen lakes of New England to the Caribbean for them to make ice cream, for them to put in their drinks, and for them to keep in their room to cool their rooms. It didn't work at first, he went bankrupt, but then finally it took off in the Caribbean right around 1820, where he became the king of cold, Frederick Tudor. And it worked for him as a business because think about it. In those days, ships would come from the Caribbean loaded with bananas and molasses and sugar and all of the stuff that was grown in high energy environments, where it's warm is called a high energy environment, and brought to Boston and New York and Philadelphia, which is cold, that's a low energy environment. The ships would unload, would return empty. Frederick Tudor said, wait a minute, I'll put my ice in your ship. Secondly, the ice was free. You just had to pay people to cut chunks out of it out of frozen lakes. And thirdly, the insulation you used to prevent the ice from melting was also free, it was sawdust from the lumber mills of New England. So he, would, he was able to send huge blocks of ice all the way across to the Caribbean and made a fortune on it. So many things happened in terms of the uh, hummingbird effect, including the impact it had on the Midwest. All of a sudden now you could ship beef and other meats to the east. The big markets were all in the east. New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Washington, DC. But all of the cattle was being reared in Texas or in Arizona or in uh, plains of Kansas and Iowa. And they couldn't be shipped because they would, be spo they would spoil in the cars. So refrigerated cars where he put blocks of ice on the top of the cars. Today, of course, you have air conditioning and therefore transformed the Midwest. The Midwest is directly attributable to the technology of cold. Without that, there would be no Chicago because Chicago then became the center of all slaughterhouses and meat packing and were able to ship fresh beef to the east of New Zealand, I mean, New England. What if the ships going down to the Caribbean got hit by hurricanes? You lost your ice. So artificial cold was something people started thinking about. Gee, if we can get natural cold, how can we get artificial cold? And once again, the hummingbird effect struck. In 1842, there was an accident of weather where a doctor called John Gorey in Florida, a really good doctor, was treating a lot of patients from malaria and all other insect-borne diseases. And the way you could solve, anyone know how the best way to take care of people who fall sick with these kind of viral diseases? Well, you keep them in very cool, dry climates. The hotter it is, the worse the virus gets. She knows, you must be a medical student. Um, so one winter, 
hurricanes destroyed all the ice that was coming to Florida, and he, his patients started to die. So he said, I gotta figure out a way to create artificial cold, and he built the first air conditioner. And he used air as the refrigerant. I mean, the, every, anybody know Boyle's Law around here? Who knows what is Boyle's Law? PV equal to RT. The more pressure you put on it, you know, the cold, the, and then you, if you take the air out, the way he, in, he figured it out was that he took a, a glass jar, put a live bird in it, extracted all the air out, the bird died, okay, he created vacuum, but in the process he found that the world had also frozen because the temperature had dropped, because the pressure had come down. So Boyle's Law was the basis. You guys are all scientists here, so this should be interesting for you guys. I'm surprised you didn't know Boyle's Law. But he used air to compress, and then as he uncompressed it, he was able to extract heat out of the surroundings and create it. Then came a Frenchman called Ferdinand Carré, who then used ammonia as the refrigerant, and now you had real air conditioning. So by the end of the 19th century, air conditioning became the huge way of storing the beef and the vegetables and all of the other stuff that was coming from all over the world to New York and to Boston and to Philadelphia. Huge. The, have you heard of the Tribeca uh, area of New York? Who knows where Tribeca is? There's the Tribeca Film Festival. Have you heard of that? Well, it's a big region in New York. And today, you know, it's all very up, upscale apartments and condos, but it used to be gigantic city block worth of air conditioning units powered by steam and ammonia refrigerants. So the next natural step is from going from these gigantic air conditioning devices to small. But to this day, when we talk about air conditioning, we measure it in tons, right? I have a six ton air conditioner. Why is that? It's the equivalent of how many tons of ice was needed to produce the same kind of cold. So now do you know why we say, I have a six ton air conditioner? Did you know that before this? Hopefully there are some aha moments going on out here. And the god of air conditioning is Willis Carrier, a Boston engineer who finally developed the smaller and smaller and smaller air conditioner. He started off as an accident, he then cooled the movie theater, and then he finally was able to make it as small as a kitchen appliance. So that's the story of the air conditioner. You know, he went from probably the greatest story of miniaturization is the air conditioner. Far greater than even the story of miniaturization of the microprocessor. You go from a city block large device to something that you can put in the window of your kitchen. Bolt has allowed cryogenics. Think about, I'm talking about, this is yet another hummingbird effect of the technology of cold, which allows you to chew this hat. The next technology was cold, a warm item for you guys. Now let's talk about sound, which probably has had as much of an impact on our planet as both glass and cold. For 100,000 years, when human beings started to really have some sentience, Sound fascinated them. And how do we know this? Well, recently, there's a large cave being found in central France called Arcy sur Cure, which is the caves of Arcy on the river Cure. And in it, 30,000 years ago, they've discovered the most incredible paintings, cave paintings, the oldest example of cave paintings on Earth. But what was more fascinating, fascinating about the paintings was not, about, not the quality of the paintings themselves, which are terrific, but where they were located. Each and every painting was located at a spot that reverberated, if you spoke, that echoed. You'd have up to seven echoes coming back and a very primitive form of sound engineering that they discovered through the natural caves as we are today with our amplifiers and our speakers and till 200 years ago, till 150 years ago. And it really started after the age of enlightenment. You really call it a Klarung, Klarung. And I'm missing the umlaut according to my German friend on the Aufklarung. But the age of enlightenment ended and all of a sudden the industrial revolution started. And they had by that time been able to dissect human cadavers and figure out how the ear worked. 
the, the eardrum vibrated and sent electrical signals to the brain that then translated them into sound. That's how you're hearing me today. It's hitting your eardrum, signals going to your brain, and you're then translating it. In, eight, in the 1850s, a very interesting guy, Leon Scott, Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville, a Frenchman. You'll find a lot of these innovations have come from France. No wonder they're so proud of themselves. Uh, decided that there has to be a better way of doing stenography. Do you all know what stenography is? Anybody, you know, you're too young to understand stenography because today you can have speech to text directly into your phone. But sten stenographers were people like secretaries who you would dictate to and then they would write at the same speed you were speaking in squiggles, which then they would then look and type into words, but they would use squiggles. So Mr. Leon Scott figured, okay, if a secretary can write squiggles, why can't we take human voice and turn it into squiggles? And he was able to do that two decades before Edison built the phonograph. Pretty interesting if you can beat Edison by 20 years. But what he forgot was even though he was able to pull sound out of the air and record it, the human eye is not able to factor and figure out these kinds of squiggles. Chord, and then use a stylus to play it back. It's again, totally invisible to all of you because you don't need any of this stuff. None of you have ever, how many of you have even seen a phonograph? One old guy in the back. Well, Edison invented it not for music, which is where the old long playing records and CDs all came from, and you chip. Interesting combo because Bell Labs, in my mind, is the single greatest idea factory the world has ever known. It put out more innovations, more inventions, more technologies that change the world than any other organization. And it was all as a result of the telephone becoming a monopoly. But think about another thing. The telephone was the first job opportunity for women. Till then, women stayed home. They were seamstresses or whatever else they were, but it was the first time 250,000 women were put into the job workforce to become telephone operators. People who would connect you. You would pick up the phone. Remember you see in movies, you then turn the wheel. Hello, 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 yes, who would you like to speak to? Well, I'd like to speak to so-and-so. And then they would do the, the, the cord board, as it's called. It's 250,000 jobs were created for women. The first start of the women's suffragette movement. Who would have thought the telephone was the reason for women to start thinking about getting the right to vote? That's because 250,000 women were able to sit together, earn a good salary, though one quarter of what men were paid. Always discrimination. Anyway, the next thing was digitizing voice. Because the problem with the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell's telephone was that, I think I'll just hold this here, was that it degraded over distance, needed amplification, and was very noisy. And then came World War II, and there was need not only for communications between the United States and England, which is where the two centers of the war was being fought against Germany, but they needed secrecy because the Germans were happily listening in to all the conversations going on. So they needed some kind of secrecy, and along came this hero of mine, Alan Turing. Anyone know who he is? You all saw the movie, right? with Benedict Cumberbatch. Who all saw the movie? Okay, what was he famous for in the movie? Cryptography, yeah, he, he, he broke the Enigma code. But that's not what I think he should be most famous for. I think he should be most famous for digitizing sound. He created a system called Sig Sally. You can see the picture up there. Gigantic room full of gear, but Sig Sally what it did was it took a wave of sound and sampled it 20,000 times and was the father of modern digital data. Alan Turing, in an effort to beat the Germans, created digital data. And today our whole world is digital. The technology of sound created digital everything. Digital light, digital whatever. And without this, we may never have gotten there. 
The other area of sound was radio. Think about radio. Radio was originally intended by Marconi to, rep uh, to replace telegraph, and he got that wrong. Just like Edison got the phonograph wrong and Bell got the telephone wrong, Marconi got the radio wrong, but yet it was an unbelievable invention, unbelievable technology. And then in the, 18, in the early 1900s came a guy called Lee DeForest. He invented a gas tube called the Audion, which he used to try to amplify sound. He got that wrong because it wasn't gas that you needed in the tube. He was the father of the first vacuum tube, which was eventually invented by AT&T because he went bankrupt and he sold his patent to AT&T. And they decided, ah, it isn't really gas you need in this, you need vacuum. And as a result, the vacuum tube was created, amplifiers were created, radio was created, and what were the hummingbird effects of these creations? World War II. You say, ha, ah, how could a vacuum tube create World War II? Without amplifiers, Hitler could never have spoken to 150,000 people at a time at his Nuremberg rallies. Without the Nuremberg rallies, he would never have come to power. If he had never come to power, who knows, Germany would never have fought World War II. The Audion by Lee Forest turning into the vacuum tube by Bell Labs may have caused World War II. It also, in my mind, caused civil rights because the radio was the first time black culture was experienced by white people. Billie Holiday, Satchmo, um, Duke Ellington, all these great musicians who were huge stars in the South but were unheard of to any white people were now coming over the radio. And people were enjoying the music generated by black artists in white homes. So the thought process of saying, well, gee, you know, they're kind of like us. Maybe they're better than us, started to percolate into the thinking of white consciousness. So my view is that maybe the radio also had the hummingbird effect of civil rights, because it also had Martin Luther King give his I, dream of, I, I have a dream speech. Interesting thought, kind of comes from nowhere, right? The radio may have caused World War II and may have caused civil rights. And also, the technology of sound ended up with sonar. The Titanic sank in 1912, so he had to come up with a way of figuring out underwater problems. The Canadian Reginald Fassenden invented sonar, couldn't, is this too much? Yeah? So anyway, and the impact of sound has been amazing. The technology of sound, when people say sound, you think music, you think sound, but just think about all of what it has created, including World War II and civil rights. Now let's get to the technology of clean. Well, we don't realize that till the mid 1850s, there was no way to clean cities. Most cities would let their waste go through sewers. Sewers have existed for a long time, down a slope into the nearest river. That's why most cities were built on rivers. You think about any major city and they're built on a river. Paris, London, wherever. Heidelberg. And this was not a very healthy way of living. That's why cities never got very large. And when they got large, you had the Black Plague or Black Death, and people died off and populations reduced because getting rid of waste was the number one problem for cities. And it was even more so in a city like Chicago, which was exploding in size because of the technology of cold. Somebody said, who said cold? Yeah, I went to the top of the class. Man, you only guy who paid attention. Because of the technology of coal, Chicago's slaughterhouses and uh, meatpacking industry exploded, and they now tripled their population. One other big problem in Chicago, completely flat. And because Chicago and Lake Michigan were caused, caused by glacial erosion, also they were very non-porous, the land. Chicago is dead flat. And the human excrement and animal excrement that lined the streets of Chicago, and you gotta read about it, and you gotta see the early daguerreotype photographs of, uh, of Chicago to see what a filthy place it was. In fact, the city 
leaders would import large hordes of pigs to eat all the waste, but then they would create their own waste. And then when it rained, you would have three feet high mud and shit all across the street. This was the city of Chicago, the fastest growing city in the world at the time. What do you do? How do you get rid of the waste? No slope. You can't even run it off into Lake Michigan. Put sewers in, you have to dig deep, very hard, non-porous ground. Lots of buildings have already been built. Along came another genius called Ellis Chesbro. And he said, wait a minute, we just invented the jack screw. You know what you use to raise uh, your car to change your tire? That is a more modern version of the jack screw. You turn a handle and it lifts. So he says, if we can't go under Chicago, why don't, did anyone know that? Who in this audience knew that the city, wow, another guy went to the top of the class, that the city of Chicago that you see today, this wonderful, beautiful, bustling city was 10 feet lower 150 years ago. So building by building, block by block, Ellis de Chesbro raised Chicago 10 feet, late sewer lines down to Lake Michigan and cleaned up Chicago. A lot of cities followed suit in this way uh, and it also became the template for subway systems. The first, country, uh, first city to install subway systems was London and others followed, but that was another hummingbird effect that we're not spending too much time talking about. But solving the waste problem of Chicago created another problem, drinking water. All this waste was going where? Lake Michigan. Where did all the drinking water for Chicago come from? Lake Michigan. So what do we do about that? So Chesbro solved one problem and created another one. So he said, well, what do we do? Getting rid of the water is not enough. We need drinking water, and drinking water in those days was playing Russian roulette. It was also exacerbated by the fact that people just didn't bathe. Everybody, all of you had a shower today this morning, right? Before coming here. Back in those days, bathing once a year was too much. The theory was that bathing was the reason for getting diseases. And they may have been right because a lot of the water was contaminated. Soap was very hard to get, and bathing was an absolute rarity. And washing hands never took place. There was a Hungarian doctor called Ignaz Hemmelweis who said doctors ought to wash their hands. And he was mocked, derided, and made fun of. But then he proved that washing hands helps because he looked at the statistics between two hospitals, one where a hospital for very rich people had higher infant mortality than a hospital for poor people because in the poor people, it was midwives delivering the babies and they were washing their hands and in the rich hospitals, the doctors were delivering them and they were not washing their hands. So as you can see, all of these things were happening. Chicago's filth, people suddenly realized, people not bathing and people realizing that washing hands could help, came up with a very smart English doctor called John Snow identified the first bacterium using whose microscope? Technology of glass. Using a microscope, he was able to identify, and he, the first concept that there was invisible organisms that killed people. It was the first time people said, today we know, you know, you get, you get sick, better take an antibiotic because you want to kill all the bacteria that's killing you. Didn't exist till then. Once again, glass came to the rescue. Robert Koch, famous Nobel laureate, was able to first, using a German microscope maker, Zeiss, and was able to isolate and identify the cholera bacterium. And cholera was killing people at a huge rate in Chicago. And he was not only able to identify the bacterium, but he was able to identify what level of bacteria in the water was safe. So he was able to say, okay, if you're less than 100 colonies per milliliter, it's safe. Prior to Coke, the way you figured out if your water was safe to drink, how did you figure it out? You waited for people to die. Oh, not safe. They lived safe. With Robert Coke and the technology of clean, he, he figured out 
how do you measure when the water is safe? But that was not enough. You had to come up with a way of killing the germs if there were more than 100 milliliters. And it took a guy called John Leal in New Jersey at the turn of the century, where he secretly at night, against the wishes of the city fathers, went and put chlorine in the water supply of New Jersey City. And the water was mass chlorinated in 1908, and it solved the city's problem. Calcium hypochlorite, which is chlorine, rendered the city completely pure and wholesome. And from then on, it got implemented all across the United States. So just think about it. Filth in Chicago. Ellis Chesbro takes it into the lake. John Leal figures out that chlorine can kill bacteria, secretly does it at night. And by 1930, all of the cities of the United States are chlorinating the water. Infant mortality drops by 75%. An unbelievable legacy. How many of us in this room had heard of John Leal? How many of us in this room had heard of Ignaz Hemmelweis? These are the people why some of us are alive today. The odds of anyone in this room being alive were one in four when you were born. Think about it. And today we take it for granted. Think about the impact it has on parents, the grief of losing a child. People lived with it all the time back 150 years ago. Today, it's an unthinkable thing to lose a child, right? I have grandchildren. It'd be unthinkable. And we take it for granted. But we don't thank Robert Koch, John Leal, and all those other people who made this possible. The technology of, co of, of clean. But the technology of clean had one other impact. Not just saving lives. It had the impact on fun. Now you could build clean swimming pools. Swimming pools were built at a very rapid rate. And what hummingbird effect did that have? Anyone want to take a guess? Pardon? Water parks? No. Uh, but, but water parks were built. What it had is on women's fashion. Back in 1900, we have a Miss USA here, and she probably had a swimsuit contest. And we'll see how we got there. Because in 1900, 10 yards of fabric to go swimming. Over time, the women said, wait a minute, I can't swim with all this junk on me. They reduced to one yard of fabric. But it was still a very male-dominated society, and they had swimsuit police on every beach, every swim public swimming pool in this country. You see this guy with the tape measuring how high above the knee it is? There were laws that said your skirt had to be this much above the knee. Can you believe that, guys? The guys, particularly. <laughs> Ridiculous, but in that time, it was already a huge jump from the 10 yards to the one yard. Then came the two-piece swimsuit, and that's when Hollywood embraced it. Then came the bikini. That's Daniela Bernardini, the first swimsuit model of a bikini ever. And then, of course, today we have people like Tyra Banks and Lauren over here. But think about it. This hummingbird effect of the technology of clean creating swimming pools, allowing the woman to control her body more, is another trigger for the freedom of women, the rise of the equality, because the woman can now be equal to the man without having swimsuit police coming there and humiliate them and measure how many inches above the knee their dress is. Interesting? The technology of fun. But it has had a huge impact on the way the world views women, both good and bad. Mostly, hopefully, the result is good. And then there's the technology of hygiene coming from the technology of clean, which is, till now we've talked about public health, but there was also personal health. When John Leal did his thing in New Jersey, Annie Murray in Oakland took that same chlorine and came up with Clorox. She bottled that same chlorine in bottles, and all of a sudden you had a new product that people could use in their homes. Didn't exist till then. Till 100 years ago, people never cleaned their homes. People are looking at me puzzled. How can this be only 100 years ago? 
Clorox was the first home cleaning product ever. And it launched complete new industries. It launched the industry of advertising. Magazines and newspapers were all inundated. And then when TV came, it launched the soap opera. Why is it called a soap opera, daytime television? It's because all of these companies sold their products during those daytime television shows, the theory being women were the only one watching, women were the only ones that would clean homes, so the women need to be brainwashed into buying these products. Thankfully, that's no longer the case. But a whole new industry worth 80 billion was launched by John Leal putting chemicals in the New Jersey city water. Kind of interesting to think, right? $80 billion industry it was an accident of one guy. And finally, I would say the technology of clean is directly responsible to the, for the microprocessor. You're going, huh? Well, think about it. You need a pathway of one-tenth of a micron. In fact, some of the latest microprocessors have pathways of one-hundredth of a micron. You know what a micron is, guys? You know, you're going to be finding out when you do 3D printing. Micron, one millionth of a meter. And human hair is 100 microns, and you need one-tenth to one-hundredth of a micron for your pathway. And how do you do that? They need very fine robotic and laser tools. Again, laser technology of glass. And even a speck of dust is like the city of Manhattan having Mount Everest land on it. And you will not have a microprocessor because the speck of dust is three to five microns. And the technology of clean allows us to be able to build these microprocessors because what do we use as solvents to make microprocessors? We use 100% pure water. The water we drink is impure. It has to have calcium and chlorine and magnesium and iodine and various things in it. But the water used in microprocessor manufacturing is pure. It's just H2O. And drinking it, what will it do? What did someone say? It'll kill you. So just think about it. 150 years ago, we cleaned water so that it wouldn't kill us. And now we have created water that will kill us because it is too clean. Full circle we've come. Again, these technologies driving us. Technology of time. This is my fifth. Are we, are we getting bored here, guys? This gentleman looks a little bored. No, you, who turned around, no? Anyway, I'll, I'll, how much time do I have left? As much as you need. Okay. So the technology of time was, till 400 years ago, calculated by looking at the sun. You see, how, where, when was the sun at its peak? And you use sundials to measure when it was at its peak. And you said, okay, that's when the day is. And then 24 hours later, it returns to that spot. And then you roughly calculated your day into minutes, hours, seconds by dividing by an old Egyptian numbering system, which is the system of 12. And that is what has stayed with us for 5,000 years. And clocks that were developed starting in Germany, Germany was, the f and then eventually going to Switzerland, but Germany and England where, where clocks first started, were terribly inaccurate. They could be off by as much as 20 minutes a day. So every noon, all the clockmakers would rush and look at the sun, oh, this should be noon, and they would adjust their clocks back to 12 noon. But in those days, being split-second accurate was not a big deal. It was a preposterous idea that you could be that accurate, and it was not necessary. If you're going to go visit your neighbor uh, or you're in the next city, you're not going to say, I'll be there at 6 o'clock. You're going to say, I'll be there when I get there, because you're going to take a horse or something else and get there. So split-second accuracy only became important for what reason? Anyone want to take a guess? Yes, this young man seems very smart. Wow, you go right to the head of the class by sailors. Good job, young man. You needed accurate time to be able to figure out longitude. Latitude was easy, you looked at the sky. 
and you saw where you were in terms of the latitude. So the equator versus the North Pole, that's the 90 degrees of latitude. But longitude, going east to west, west to east, was very difficult. The way the sailors did it, the way Columbus did it, was you had two clocks, as inaccurate as they could be. One was set to the time of Lisbon, which is where he set sail for, and one was reset every day looking at the sun. Well, you have several problems with that approach. One is, by the second day, you're off 20 minutes, so you're already, and one, one degree of longitude is four minutes. You know, divide 24 hours by 360, it comes up with four. And so if you're off by 20 minutes, you could be off five degrees by the second day. Second problem, bad weather, no sun. How do you determine where you are? So the problem was really driven by the requirement for sailors to go on open water. Till then, most sailing was done by staying close to shore. You hugged the shoreline. You rarely went across. That's why, for instance, when the Crusaders tried to cross the Mediterranean, they would make sure they stopped in Malta, raped and pillaged and looted, then they would stop in Cyprus, and then they would finally get to somewhere near, and then they would get to Alexandria. But as long as you were, if you could determine time to the split second, you could determine where you were when you were sailing, and then you would have a brand new industry. And that came about by this other great genius that we already talked about, Galileo. He was a student at the University of Pisa. And you all, how many of you are familiar with his experiment as he went to the Leaning Tower of Pisa and dropped two balls, one small ball and one big ball? No? He proved that gravity works, that the big ball and the small ball fell at the same time. But that's not the experiment I'm talking about. He was listening to prayers in the Duomo, which is the big church, next to the Leaning Tower, and he got bored, and he start, looked at the lamp. The altar lamp was swinging, and he found something very strange. It started off swinging in large arcs, and then as it got later, it, the arc reduced. You know, if you do it, the pendulum gets less and less and less as it runs out of energy, but he realized that the time it took for each arc was identical. Big arc, it moved faster, Small arc, it moves slower. And how did he figure out? What clock did he use to measure how he knew it was exactly the same time? This is Galileo. Think about what he might have done. He used his pulse as the stopwatch to calculate the time of the swinging of the arc. And it stayed with him for 58 years. That thought that the arc of a pendulum is dependent not on the size, the time of the arc of a pendulum is not dependent on the size of the arc, but the size of the string. So in 1641, before he died, he designed the first pendulum clock, which then started keeping time to the accuracy of about a couple of seconds, three seconds. The first pendulum clock, and unfortunately, he died before it was built, but it was his design that was, that was first created and then put on ships, and it changed the perception of time and it allowed global shipping to take place. You really had no global shipping till then. You had people going along coastlines and shipping. And by the 1860s, a very bright Massachusetts inventor created the timepiece, and it became a must-have. You know the timepiece, you see people putting them in their waistcoat pockets in peak, 12 noon, they would set all their clocks at 12 noon. So if you're in Pittsburgh versus Philadelphia, you were about 15 minutes off. And if you were to try to take a train, let's say, from New York to Philadelphia to Chicago, and you say, I'm going to take the 10 o'clock, but it may not be 10 o'clock in New York. Maybe 10.05 and you missed the train. But this, it was exacerbated by, the, by the, the, you know, the fact that we had the transcontinental railroad, so people needed accurate times. And so England was able to figure it out. By, because it's a small country, by saying, okay, we're going to standardize on one time, which is the time at Greenwich, and we're going to use the telegraph to send every city when is noon. So these cities could then reset their clocks to when noon should be every day, and there would be small amounts, because with the timepiece now, it was keeping time up to like three seconds plus minus per day. 
and they would reset their clocks to 12 noon by telegraph. The US, 8,000 towns, each having their own happy little time. Till the, along came another genius, William Allen. He designed the four time zones. And he based it on six hours, five hours, seven hours, eight hours from Greenwich Mean Time. And was synced by telegraph, just like England. He used the English model. And so each time zone would then start syncing. So uh, it was in, eight, in uh, November 18th, 19, 1883, where New, New York had two 12 noons. They had the 12 noon that was based on them looking at the sun. And five minutes later, they had the 12 noon when they reset to Eastern Standard Time. Useless piece of trivia, right? New York had two 12 noons on November 18th, 1883. And therefore, for the first time, the world was no longer dependent on the sun to keep time. Well, the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for anything. Well, Pierre Curie discovered piezoelectricity, the fact that you could compress and expand quartz, and it was extremely accurate. And what happened? Quartz became the basis. It was accurate up to one one thousandth of can expand at incredibly accurate rates. Quartz rules everything. All our devices are run by quartz. And it also led to the, you know, another hummingbird effect, the microprocessor. And without that, we don't have the modern computer clock for us to figure out that the sun is not perfect. We do not revolve around the sun exactly once every 24 hours. 23 hours, 59 minutes, 59 seconds, 0.5 maybe, the next day, maybe 60.2, but not exactly 24, which has been the mantra for all scientists till 1970. So we've come full circle. Not only do we not revolve around the sun, but we do not have a 24-hour day, which leads us to the atomic age. Niels Bohr discovered, who all know, who all are chemistry people here? This lady is for sure, right? She's, Niels Bohr discovered that the atom consists of new, neutrons, protons, electrons, that circled the neutron and proton, and is capable of measuring the spin of the electron in nanoseconds. And the first atomic clock were based on the cesium atom. Now, for you chemistry students, look at this. Cesium is 54 protons, 58 neutrons, for an atomic weight of 133. But with each proton, you have an equivalent electron. That's the whole concept of Niels Bohr, right? Protons equal electrons. But it has 54 electrons out of the 55 in perfect symmetry, and one lone up there rotating all by itself. This is why the cesium atom is used for the basis of all atomic clocks, because that one lone atom rotates around 9,192,631,770 primes per second around the atom. So you have this perfect time that if you base a clock on the cesium atom's 55th electron, you will be accurate to 1 in 1.3 billion years. Interesting? I don't see a lot of people going, wow. Wow, the oldest guy in the room. So we, and this ability to calculate time so accurately gives us what most of you used to get here today, which is your GPS. We use GPS to get here. Yeah, me too. Without the atomic clock, you have no GPS. And the reason you have GPS is that we have 24 atomic clocks in low Earth orbit around our globe. And your phone, every second, is pinging three of these clocks. So you're pinging that one, that one, and that one. And calculating the time taken to travel to each one down to the nanosecond, and calculating the difference, and knowing exactly where those satellites are, and you know to about a foot as to where you stand. Did you, know, is that, did you all know how that is how GPS worked? How did you think GPS worked before a minute ago? Just some kind of magic? 
It's the, it's the 24 satellites that are circling the Earth that allow you to have GPS and the ability to measure time to such great accuracy. So the technology of time allows you not to get lost driving anywhere. And that's the beauty of this kind of technology. And there's another aspect to equal time. You know, here we've been talking about going from three second, from 20 minute inaccuracy to three second accuracy to a millisecond accuracy to a nanosecond accuracy to one billionth of a second accuracy with atomic clocks. But what if we went the other way? What about clocks that could calculate in the thousands of years? And that's based on Marie Curie's discovery of radio. And the two elements that were most accurate and usable for aging is carbon. Decays once every 1.3 billion years and carbon every 5,730 years. Why is that important? Well, you're able to determine the age of human migration and animal migration and be able to determine the age of our Earth. It's not 6,000 years, guys. How many of you think the Earth is only 6,000 years old? It's 2.3 billion years old, proven by radiocarbon dating. And we are able to prove when man crossed the Bering Sea and came to the United States, what is today the US. We're able to prove when the dinosaurs went extinct. We're able to prove all these other wonderful things that have added so much to our knowledge and all because of the technology of time. The way we can look into our past is all based, just like glass allows us to look into the past, time allows us to look into the past. Because till we got radiocarbon dating, we didn't have the technology that allowed us to have chronology and causation. And with that, we now know how we as people involved, from when Lucy stood up 4.3 million years ago to us standing here today. We all know who Lucy is, right? The first Homo erectus. And what will happen in the future? Only time will tell, but that's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> the final is the technology of light. So look at all these. When, when I asked all of you at the start, guess on a technology, none of you thought of any of these six, did you? But do you all agree that these are sort of eye-opening technologies that just allow you to say, wow, that's how we got to where we are today. It's because of all of those technologies and all of those people. So let's look at the last one, which is light. Artificial light was basically fire. 100,000 years, man lived by fire alone, and then came candles, became the only solution for artificial lighting. You had tallow candles, which most monks would use. They're cheap animal fat candles, burned very dim light, very yellow light, and were used by mostly the poor. Beeswax candles were brighter, whiter, better, but were very expensive. And when candles existed, people didn't sleep eight hours a day. If you're living in New York and it's dark for 14 hours, what do you do for the darkness of 14 hours? Well, you don't sleep all 14 hours. You sleep four, you wake up, you do your chores, you do other things, you maybe have some drinks with your friends, then you go back to sleep. So sleeping patterns in our DNA is not eight hours. The reason we have insomnia, some of us, for me, fortunately not, I sleep like a rock, but it's because our DNA says you need to wake up at two. Because you'd sleep from eight to two or six, six to 10 and then wake up and then go back to sleep again. So the technology of light will also control our sleeping pattern. Then in the 18th century, uh, on the shore off of Nantucket, they discovered a dead sperm whale, cut them open, and found 500 gallons of spermaceti, they call it, because the oil that was in the brain of, just above the brain of the whale, looked like sperm, so they called it spermaceti, but it created beautiful light compared to beeswax and to tallow. 
And it became so popular that we almost drove this wonderful, magnificent creature to extinction. 300,000 sperm whales were killed in 100 years by a population that wasn't even a billion. The planet reached a billion people in 1850. Just think about it, we're seven and a half billion today. There are more people alive today than have died. Simple statement. So this was going to be the only source of artificial light until we discovered a new source. What was that? Save the whale. What saved the whale? Petroleum. We were able to extract kerosene from petroleum. Texas had a little something to do with it. So we do come out okay in one area. Even though we're not very ecological, we did save the sperm whale from extinction. And the kerosene lamp burned brighter, and it allowed people to read after dark, because it was cheap, it wasn't dangerous, it didn't set fire to, you know, because it used to be in nice little glass uh, cans, and you could read after dark. And the first change in humanity's sleep patterns occurred upon the arrival of the kerosene lamp. You all take your eight hours or seven hours or six hours of sleep or 10 hours if you're students for granted, right? That wasn't the case. Not till 120 years ago, 110 years ago, till the arrival of the kerosene lamp. Then came the electric lamp, the natural progression from kerosene lamp is electric lamp and Thomas Edison figured it out. I mean, yes, there's a lot of complaints that uh, he wasn't the only one, but yeah, I give him the credit. He figured out the filament. The problem with the electric lamp was this filament that, that brightens. People were using platinum, it would melt. So he figured out carbonized bamboo filaments. He sent like 20 of his people from his R&D lab in Menlo Park, New Jersey, to various parts of the world. One guy died trying to find stuff in the Amazon. Finally, somebody went to China and got the bamboo and said, this is the best. So I think we have it reversed now. Now everything goes to China to be made. Their Chinese stuff was coming here to be made. So it's gotten flipped around. And then he lit Pearl Street in Lower Manhattan, and the world changed. That's probably if you had to throw one switch, pun intended, as to when the world changed in terms of light. It was 1891 when Thomas Edison lit 20 square blocks of Manhattan, the Pearl Street area. And now we had city lighting, because it was quite, quite a job. You had to have a source of current that went to all locations. You had to have enough bulbs, connectors, wires, meters, all of the above. Today, we take it for granted. And at the same time, we had flash photography. Flash photography was invented by an Englishman called Charles Smythe. Not Smith, Smythe. Very proper. He was asked to photograph the inside of the Pyramid of Giza, and he mixed gunpowder with magnesium. Almost blew himself up several times while experimenting, but was able to take pictures. That's him up top. And then came two Germans, Adolf Mitte and Werner Gedeke. Did I pronounce it right? Close. And they created another component called flash. Why is this important? Why did I go from Edison to Smythe and Gedeke? Well, because the technology of clean, of light, sorry, had another major impact, a hummingbird effect. Jacob Rice, Danish immigrant, living in New York City, journalist was very, very touched by what he saw in the tenements of New York. When you think of American cities today, you don't think of the slums of Brazil or Bombay with people living in utter squalor, do you? We don't. You have to give credit to this man, Jacob Rice, because till then, the tenements of New York were worse than what you would find in the slums of Bombay and Sao Paulo today. And he was very frustrated that all the articles he printed in his magazines and newspapers had no impact on people because people couldn't visualize. When he's talked about the filth and squalor in written word, people couldn't visualize it. So he used flash photography to go into the tenements and take pictures and publish them. 
That, you've all heard the term muckraker? Who all have heard the term muckraker? You know what, guys? You know, your smartphones aren't helping your vocabulary. But muckraker is a term that's now commonly used for people who create um, controversy. But it came from raking muck from the tenements of New York. He was actually out there raking up the muck for people to see. Muck being filth and dirt. That kind of a, that's a little lesson in etymology. <laughs> the origin of words. It's almost done. So he took pictures, published a book, became a bestseller, and it created the single largest change in public opinion on social responsibility. Huge impact. So the hummingbird effect, you create Blitzlicht to take pictures of pyramids and you change the social perception of people regarding poverty and squalor. Interesting how to connect those dots, right? Very few people would. Neon, impact of light, changed the way we advertise. Was a Frenchman again, zapped neon with electricity, it glowed red. Then a Utah guy came up with neon signs and now we have them all across the world and they are probably the single biggest factor in postmodern architecture and design. You go to Las Vegas, all you see is neon. You go to Times Square, all you see is neon. Didn't exist till 1920. And finally, light and science fiction. Science usually creates art, commerce, stories, but sometimes art, commerce, stories create science. It goes the other way, and that's science fiction. When you think about what Jules Verne came up with when he wrote 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, he conceived of a submarine. Submarines didn't exist in those days. We have them today. H.G. Wells conceived of the death ray when he wrote War of the Worlds. Basically, he was talking about lasers long before lasers existed. This was in 1908 or something he wrote this book. 60 years later, we invented the laser in Bell Labs. Bell Labs again. It did not become part of our everyday life because the death ray, the laser, is really not very good for weapons. They're only good for reading data. And we ended up with the barcode reader. And today, barcode readers exist in every store. They become so much part of our life. I remember <laughs> times when there were no barcodes. Most of you have no idea what the world was like without barcodes. But barcode readers have changed the way we live. And it's because of lasers. It's changed the way we sequence DNA. We can sequence DNA because of lasers. And we can even conceive of nuclear fission, fusion, I'm sorry, nuclear fusion because of lasers. Lawrence Livermore Labs is trying to bombard hydrogen atoms with very high speed, high density lasers and try to create clean energy, nuclear fusion. That is the, that is the goal of all scientists, to be able to create abundant, free energy. That's how you change the world. And again, it's lasers. Again, it's the technology of light. So in the end, you know, today, great innovations, great technologies are collective effort. In the past, they were flashes of inspiration of a genius. Galileo's telescope, Tudor's ice farms, go all the way to Chesbro's jack screws, Edison's light bulb. They were the triggers for these various technologies that changed the world. And when, when you really think about it, these are not that old. Glass only 800 years old, light only 150 years old. And who knows what's coming next. But when you think about how we are standing here today, thinking about all of around us, our smartphones, our air conditioners, our glass, a microphone, amplifier, being able to send this on YouTube all across the globe on fiber optic cables, Hopefully, the last hour has helped you a little bit into the insight of not taking all of this for granted. Because these innovators that changed the world for us had great genius, great tenacity. And they eventually did things that we today are the beneficiaries of. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hope it was interesting. You know, it was the first time I've given this talk to anybody anywhere. You were my guinea pigs. Thank you so much.
Fantastic, right? So if, if I could just have everybody stand up, stretch out. Any, any questions? Any questions from anyone? Here's a gentleman with a question. Research, reading, yes. Well, no, these are all the technologies that I read about. So I didn't limit myself. Good question, though. All right, everybody. If I could have you like, just sit back down for a few more minutes. Ashok, please don't go. If, if I would like to thank you. Because you, you have provided us, provided us with fantastic insight. Uh, to some of the innovations that have changed our world. And, uh, you know, from HCC, we really want to thank you. So I, I do have a mug. I wanted to give you that. That's temperature controlled. Right? And hopefully some of the elements. And then also we have something that is p printed uh, in one piece, and it actually does move. Yes. So if you go with that, it was printed in one, one shot. And we thank you so much for your time and your insight. You're a fantastic individual. Uh, I'm, I'm so proud that I get to call you a friend. And, yeah. uh, and not only that, but he is an active individual. And I, I would urge all of you uh, to find him on social media and reach out to him directly. He's, he's part of a group called Thai. Uh, and Thai is the Endless Entrepreneurs. He's been the global chairman. And thank God, I broke one. So just, we'll done. just print out the other one for you. But, uh, but I want to I mention that, that he, he's just a, an individual that keeps giving back in terms of knowledge, in terms of money, and everything else. I don't want to give away too much. But please reach out to him, and we thank you, thank you for being out here. Thank you so much, Ashok. We really appreciate it. My real pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thanks for putting up with me for an hour plus. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Okay. And I would like to also ask, uh, you know, so Ashok brought some of his friends, uh, and one of his friends comes from Germany. Uh, he's only here for a day, but he represents a very big, uh, uh, I want to say bioengineering innovation company, but probably not true. But it is, okay, fantastic. So I'd like to ask Christian, uh, Christian, you know, this group of students here, they're here to unleash their creativity. And, uh, you know, the Inventathon is really about you know, finding those innovations uh, probably by mistake, uh, but we want to offer, you know, as uh, as a you know in, a inventor space and as you know community college, we want to offer all these students access to these fancy equipment and ask them to play, ask them to you know make stuff and just try to break stuff, but also not like don't break the equipment, break what you print from it. But our challenge today, as most of you already found out from the website, is related to health. And, and Christian being here, you know, in Houston, we wanted to take advantage of that and give him a second, you know, give him a minute or two to explain what he does and, and, and what type of, I mean, what else could we do? You know, Ashok talked about fantastic innovations that, uh, that we don't even think about, you know, how they, how they came about. I mean, 100 years ago, 200, but they're not done. We're not done. And, and there's so many more things to yet discover. And uh, is there some stuff that I maybe mean, you could throw some insights for us so that as we're working on our projects for tomorrow, that we have you know, some, some cool things to look forward to. So uh, Christian, if you don't mind, just give us. Thanks very much, Ravi. So how many of you want to build a product that changes the world? All of them, All of them. cool. Okay, you're in the right place. So if, you, if it, your product is an app, um, you would take those statistics, it would take you $200,000 and one year to build, and your odds of being really financially successful would be one in 10,000. You think that is hard? If you were in my field, developing new medicines, uh, it would be a little different. Your odds would be similar, one in 10,000, but you would need 10 years of work in, on average, and an investment of $2.6 billion. Right? So innovation in medicine is fundamentally different from innovation in, uh, in the IT space. Uh, you need 10 times more time and 10,000 times more money. And this tells you that in this health space, 
there is a lot of room for improvement and for outstanding innovations coming from you making it better, faster, cheaper, um, and, and really make a big difference for people. I just came from a conference in San Diego. It's called Exponential Medicine. And everyone in the world that is thinking about brain-computer interfaces to stem cell therapies, printed organs, was there on stage. I mean, amazing event. And uh, I can really encourage you to, to look at the website and get some insights what, where medicine is actually going. So, um, as Ravi said, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a molecular biologist by training. Started my first uh, company during my PhD. And uh, it took me basically 15 years to look at the world's biggest innovation centers to find out what is the basis of innovation. Why are some places more productive? Some people are more productive in innovation than others. It's actually very simple. So the first thing you need to innovate is a high local density of talent. And look around you, right? Lots of talent in the room. So criterion number one, perfect. Second criterion is, and this most people don't understand this, especially politicians, and I'm not going to name them, but the point is local diversity of talent. Right? The more different perspectives you have in a room that look upon the same problem and come up with a solution, the more innovative the solution will be. And look around you. I mean, you're coming from all different cultural backgrounds, I mean, this is the perfect place to innovate, right? And third one is a local place, a local environment that is conducive to innovation, allows you to experiment where mistakes and failure are not punished, where you can talk openly, look around you, right? This is the place to innovate. And what should you be looking for in innovation? Um, and, and, and as, I, and as Ravi told you, I've, I've started an innovation center in Heidelberg where we attract the best talents from around the world Little, little older than you, postdoctoral scientists, to work on the future of medicine in a very open environment, in the middle of a biomedical campus with access to all institutions. And what you should be looking for in innovation, well, Ashok has told you, right? You need to look for the hummingbird. And, and this is something I want you to keep in mind. In order to innovate, you need to learn something that exists already, you create knowledge, you learn about the insects that are pollinating the flowers, and you take it in a completely new context, vertebrates. And then you come up with a hummingbird, right? So while you're innovating um, today, think about creating a hummingbird. And I would like to end with one of my, the favorite, uh, the, my favorite quotes, which is from Albert Einstein. It's called, um, uh, creativity is intelligence having fun. So I wish you a lot. There's a lot of intelligence in the room. I wish you a lot of creativity and a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We, we also have a, a, a mug for you, a cup for you, but we'll get that to you. So thank you so much, because that actually is a great, great segue into you should be learning. So we've definitely got some sessions planned up, uh, sessions around... Um, so if, Jeffrey, if you want to tell us what you're going to be doing, Daniel, what you're going to be doing... And then we also have Michael, uh, who's probably in the room, but you could tell him. But these are some sessions uh, around how to get started, web apps or 3D modeling, and even Bitcoin, just so that you can learn. And, and he's, he'll tell you in the details. And then our goal really for today is to first start off by making some friends. We've got an awesome food truck outside. We would love for you to bond uh, in friendship over food. So uh, as soon as the sessions are over, or before the sessions, before. before the sessions, you could get food, yes. mingle, make friends, make teams. I want to mention the schools that are here. That that um, would be awesome if, if Clemens, Dulles, Kempner, Elkins, Fort Se Settlement, Middle School and High School, Iman Academy, uh, the Elevated Places, Winchester Academy, uh, Memorial Herman and Memorial. I'm sorry, Memorial High School and Memorial Middle School, if all of you started to mingle with each other and created teams, now if you already have a team, that's fine, but I would encourage you guys, like Kirsten said, you know, let that diversity uh, and looking at ideas at a different uh, perspective, let that happen. And use the tools and resources that Roland and Jeffrey and, and Daniel and uh, Nikhil provides to really invent something cool. 
of course in health, because if you want to win some prizes, but invent something cool. So I'll let, let Jeffrey go into details, and then you're going to pass it to Nikhil, and you'll open up for lunch. And, and that's it. Right, so our sessions did say to start at 11.30, but go ahead and put those back to 12.30. Uh, so for those first three things that you see on the list, push it back an hour from what it says. Uh, so our thinking is that you're probably likely to fall into one of two categories of solutions, a, a 3D modeling or a product-based solution, uh, in which case if you need a little bit of help getting started on how you approach problems like that, we're leading some workshops throughout the day of how to get started with CAD software and how to get started with problem solving. Uh, my friend Daniel here is going to explain his little thing. Good morning, guys. Oh, standing right in front of the projector. So as he mentioned, push all of the stuff back. We want you guys to get actually to eat. That's kind of important for focusing on what we're going to try and teach you. Uh, so I'm kind of coordinating the mentors, and we'll be leading a workshop on web app development. Goodness gracious, that's bright. <laughs> so web app, anyone who's interested in web tech or in developing an app-based solution, go ahead and come down to N138, I think is the room number. And we'll kind of give you a quick presentation. And with any luck, the mentors that I've kind of rounded up to get you guys going should show up, and I can introduce you to all of them there. Sound good? Yep. There we go. Oh, right, sorry. Jeffrey just reminded me. Uh, I have set up a Slack channel. So everyone heard about the Slack stuff at the beginning of the presentation. Say yes. Yes, so we're using Slack. If you guys need to get attention of one of the mentors, since they'll be kind of wandering around, get on that. There should be a mentors channel that you can add yourself to. If you need a question, just throw it up there, and one of the five people I've got running around today should be able to get you an answer. Sound good? Yep. There we go. Cool. So we also have a couple other workshops. There's more CAD coming later in the day, virtual and we also have a virtual reality room with a HoloLens demo. Yeah, HoloLens. There's a 360 classroom uh, experience as well. Yeah, and there's a full 360 experience, so you guys can check that out after you eat. But first, what's the challenge this uh, Inventathon? The challenge is health. Make an invention that has something to do with health. Uh, I have some, uh, some ideas here to hopefully inspire you. Um, this is from last Inventathon. We had some great people, who I, some people I see here today, who made Sante, an app for uh, you know, people to track their medications. But how about something else? How about a new way to protect football players? Click. OK, well, I'll, we'll post this link in Slack so you guys can see for some inspiration. Basically, it's a squishy football helmet. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And maybe you can make something similar here today because uh, Roland's 3D printers can actually pr print squishy things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, resins, yeah. yeah. And there's another one. Oh, okay. You're going to show? How long will it take? I don't know. Uh, we'll skip it. Okay, Ashwin. Yeah, skip it. Ashwin, skip, skip it. Skip. Yeah. yeah, just share the link. Yeah, we'll share the link with you on Slack. There's also another thing. Um, okay. Um, so there's an also another thing where you can basically create a centrifuge, which is really important for biology, or a microscope just out of paper. Those links also will be shared on Slack. So with th those words, happy inventing. Uh, food is out there. Please go through this door around. And uh, before that, Ravi has a couple quick things about the building. Well, I was just going to say the same thing about, about how to get to the back. Uh, all of you, please stay in the building, make friends, and innovate. <laughs>